Welcome to Friday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us here at the end of week number 12 of our series, The New and Living Way. And I tell you, we're getting some really, really good stuff. It's not deep, just different. You just have to understand that it's all by grace and it's not by our works. That makes everything simple there. I tell you, not deep at all. I want to finish this week up by going over to the Gospel of John, Gospel of John chapter 1. And as we pointed out this week many times, and as we've looked at over this whole series, that you see a lot of comparisons between the old covenant of law and the new covenant of grace in the finished work of Jesus throughout the new covenant writings, the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of John, and then throughout the writings of Paul, you see those kind of comparisons, contrast comparisons between the old and the new. Now the reason is, is because uh, the propensity is to go back under law and regulations and rules of religion because of pride and self-righteousness to try to achieve and earn something before God. But the new covenant gives us what we're trying to get and earn and achieve by self-righteous works. It gives us by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus. Now, why would I want to continue to work for something that I can have free of charge that's better than anything I could ever earn or achieve of my own merit? Well, a lot of people say, well, because I want to take some glory for it. Well, that's exactly the reason that a lot of people, even though they came in under faith in Jesus, sometimes they gravitated back towards the rules and regulations of self-righteous works, uh, not necessarily under the Ten Commandments, but something else, whether it be some kind of other flesh-driven, self-centered rules and regulations of religion, is all the same thing. It all appeals to pride and self-righteousness. And so we have to come out of that. In order to live the life that God wants us to have, we're going to have to stay with the one that, we're going to have to dance with the one that brought us, and that is faith and grace in the finished work of Jesus. So even as believers, sometimes we get caught up in religious rules and regulations, and then we fall under condemnation, and we're not living the kind of life in the presence of God, and receiving the help that we really need from God supernaturally, and we just live live life by our own methods, means, by our own self-effort, and it's always falling short. I tell you, it's just... Is we're always coming short of what God intended for all of us as new covenant believers to live in. Now here in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now what is he talking about referring to here? He's talking about the Son of the living God, the eternal spirit, Jesus himself, who actually took upon himself flesh. You know, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, of the Virgin Mary, uh, you know, what we celebrate on Christmas, uh, that, is, that is not the beginning of the Son of God. That was begin- the beginning of the humanity of Jesus. But the Son of God always pre-existed from eternity's past with God. In fact, He was the agent of creation. But it says there, was, there came a time when the Word, the Eternal Spirit, the Son of the Living God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. We, we saw His glory. This is actually the glory of God. We saw a manifestation of the glory of God in Jesus. We beheld it. So that means right there that the glory of God is not just some kind of abstract concept or some kind of you know mysterious mist cloud floating around out there. It's actually substantive. Now notice, we beheld His glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. At that time, He was the only begotten of the Father. Now, after His resurrection, He is the first born from the dead. We are also born of the same Father. That's something we're going to be getting to in the next series. It says, the glory, of, uh, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Now notice, full of grace and truth. Notice that Jesus was the manifested glory of God, the presence and the goodness of God standing before them, and he was full of grace and truth. You're going to find out that grace and truth, or grace, truth, and glory always go hand in hand. 
that Jesus is the manifested glory of God, but he's full of grace and truth. Now notice in verse 16, and of his fullness, was he full of grace and truth? And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. The Amplified brings it out, and it's, it's actually in the, in the Greek this way, that it's grace on top of grace. In other words, you don't use up all the grace of God just coming into the initial new birth experience, just getting saved is what we say. You didn't use up all the grace of God. No, no there's more grace on top of that. There's a grace on top of grace, on top of grace, on top of grace, on top of grace. I always like to visualize it this way and use this illustration. If you go, we've all been to the beach and you sit on the beach and you just see one wave after another coming into the shore, one on top of the other. Well, that's, I think, a good illustration of the grace of God in Christ. Of his fullness, we have all received not just one grace, not just one wave, but wave after wave after wave of God's grace coming into the shores of our life. In other words, there is a constant supply in the grace of God to meet the demands. See, many times people break down. They become oppressed and depressed because they don't have a revelation of the grace and the manifested glory of God to meet and supply for their needs. So they're trying to meet the demands of life and this is exactly what the enemy wants to do in your life. He wants to get you just buried under the demands of life, trying to meet all the demands of life by your own sufficiency, by your own methods and means. And he's saying, nope, there's a supply of grace that can come from God through Jesus that's continually flowing into our life to, de to meet the demands of life. It's in the manifested glory of God. So notice in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Here's, here's that contrast comparison. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So notice what, what came by the hand of, of Moses. He didn't originate. He didn't write the law. It just was given to him and through him. And it was given to mankind through him. And it was the ministry of death and condemnation it put demands on man that we could not keep. We got buried under it. But notice in verse 17 at the end, it says, But, contrast comparison, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In other words, we can say the supply, the demand of the law was given through Moses, but the supply of grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now notice also verse 18 says, no one has seen God at any time. You know, God said, Moses, you can't look at my face and live. No one has seen the full revelation of who God is, of his absolute purity and goodness. No one has seen God at any time. And, uh, at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has brought him out and revealed him so we can all see him. Not just the back parts of God as he passes by, but we can know God face to face. We can know God in a way, in a measure, that the old covenant of saints even couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't know him. Moses, as great as he was, could not know God in the way that all of us as believers can know him. We can look and come in with full assurance of faith into the presence of God, and we can live there. We can stay there. And he, we can allow His glory to change us into that same image. You know, this really sets the stage here in the Gospel of John for really illustration and account after account of Jesus' life and ministry on the earth and how He manifested the glory of God. See, we, we see there in verse 14 and in verse 16 that Jesus is the manifestation of the glory of God, of the goodness of God. He's the manifestation of grace and truth. He came full of grace and truth. Now, he didn't just come and, and, and just say, I'm full of grace and truth, and, but I'm here and you're over there and never the twain shall meet. No, we see that Jesus was not only full of grace and truth, but he was the distribution center. He was the conduit of the glory of God, of 
the glory that meets all the demands uh, and, and the needs of man. He is channeling and, and flowing that grace and truth to all of us. Now, a, a good illustration, we can just go to the next chapter, John chapter 2. And this is the story of the wedding of Cana. Now, Jesus went with his mother to the a wedding of Cana one day. And as they were there, now, Mary, Jesus' mother, must have had something to do with planning this wedding or orchestrating or something because they ran out of wine. Now, that's a bad thing to do back then when, you know, you had a wedding going on, a wedding party going on afterward. And so she came and said, you know, we're out of wine. We're out of, we, we've run out. And Jesus initially said, ma'am, what did this to do with me? My time has not yet come. Well, Jesus, uh, Mary being the mother of Jesus, just kind of ignored what he just said there, obviously, and just turned around to the servants surrounding her and said, whatever he says to you to do, just do it. All right. Just ignore Jesus altogether <laughs> and just said, whatever he says to you, just do it. And Jesus said, all right. So he said, this is what I want you to do. Go fill up these big water pots. These were not just, you know, igloo five gallon things. We're, we're talking about 20 to 30 gallon drums that he, that were by there. There were big water pots. Jesus said, go fill them all up with water. And once they had them all filled with water, he said, now, I want you to take some out, draw some out, some water out of those drums, those water pots you just filled up. And they found out that it was wine. Now, we're not just talking about cheap stuff. We're talking about the best. In fact, the master of the ceremonies commented and said, you know, normally you bring the, the cheap stuff out last, but you save the best to last. Now, we're going to get into something down the road called the, the new wine under the new covenant. Now, this is not natural wine, okay? This is not an alcoholic beverage we're talking about. We're talking about the new wine of the Spirit of God that we have available to all of us in Christ. And that's kind of a type and shadow of that right there. But, you know, it says there in verse 11, after all this was done, after he had performed this miracle, this was the first miracle he had performed. Verse number 11, he says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. I want you to see that right there. That the, the sign, the miracle that he performed here was substantive in nature. It met a demand and met a need that was presented that day. And it said it was a manifestation of his glory and his disciples believed in him. So again, notice that the glory of God is the manifested goodness of God. It is God's goodness to meet every need, to solve every problem, and to uh, offset every challenge and obstacle that we face in life. See, we're going to have needs in life. We're going to have problems. We're going to have challenges in life. But we have to know that there is a, there is a supply according to God's riches and glory, to meet the need. And it's always going to be the best, not the inferior. See, if man would have met this need right here, in and of himself, it would have been insufficient, as noticed, and it would have been inferior. It wouldn't have been the best. But notice, out of God's manifestation of His glory that Jesus manifested that day, it was more than enough in fact, what he produced that day was more than enough. And it was the highest quality. It wasn't inferior. It was superior in every regard. Yeah, we can go to man to have, and sometimes we can work things out in and of ourself. But you always find out that man's solutions always have some kind of open, open window in the back that's letting flies in, so to speak. In other words, any solution that is man originated and man initiated is going to be insufficient in quali quality and quantity. It's going to be inferior in every regard. And many times in solving one problem is going to create 10 other side effect problems that you have to deal with. And see, that's the way man operates. But when God does it, when you allow God to manifest His glory, in the grace of God in Christ in your life and meet your need, 
it does away with the problem, but it's always the best. And it doesn't create side effects. It closes all the loopholes and creates a testimony of goodness in his life, in our life. You know, there's a story in the Old Testament of the children of Israel one day, uh, King Jehoshaphat, I think it's 2 Corinthians 20, that it talks about they were surrounded with armies on every side, more than they could handle. They had, they had a demand on them that they could not meet. And so they inquired of the Lord. They were, they were in fear. Jehoshaphat feared, the Bible says, but he set himself to seek the Lord, not produce his own way, but find out the Lord's solution to this. And God gave him an answer. He said, I want you to send the choir out there and start praising God for his goodness and his mercy, that he is good and his mercy endures forever. That was it. So they started praising God that he is good and his mercy endures forever. Well, what is the goodness of God? That is God's manifestation of glory to meet the needs of man, meet the demands presented according to man that he can't meet of his own. When they did that, all the armies that were against them turned on each other and they destroyed themselves. But you know what? That wasn't just the end of that. It took Israel three days to go gather up the spoil of that battle. They didn't do anything but praise God for his goodness and mercy. But you know what happened? They ended up getting richer in the process. That is God right there. Now I want you to see the connection. When they started praising God and magnifying God's goodness, see all my goodness passing before you, that his glory came in and solved the problem, overcame the challenge, and on the back end of that, supplied them with more than enough riches that it took them three days to, to gather up. That is God's way of doing things. Much better, isn't it? Well, that's all the time I've got for today. If you'd like additional materials and resources, go to TonyCowan.org. We'll see you next week.